Hello, everyone. You're very welcome to the third part of our webinar series of this week, Depression and Me Personal Perspectives. I just wait a few moments to allow people to join us and then we'll kick off. And maybe do what we did in session one and session two, just while we're waiting, just practicing our breathing. So breathing in, holding your breath and breathing out. Again, breathing in and breathing out. And then one last time, just noticing your breath coming into your body. And your breath leaving your body. Something I find really useful is to link breathing with words. So breathing in hope, breathing out hope. Breathing in confidence, breathing out confidence and so on. So putting on my glasses and oh, that's great. We've got loads of people. So I'd like to, again, welcome you to this three part webinar series um, celebrating Aware Mental Health Week. And really, we've been building towards this. This is a finale. We started on Monday with a conversation with Stephen McBride and myself talking about recognizing depression, the nuts and bolts. And then on Wednesday, we had a really lovely conversation with Dr. Keith Gaynor talking about how to cope with depression. So today I'm really delighted to welcome two ambassadors of AWARE, Brianna and David. And they're here to talk to us about their own personal perspectives. And just like to introduce them both briefly. And the first question I'd like to ask both of them for a few moments is why we haven't bribed them, I promise, and they're not being paid to do this. So why on earth are they becoming, putting themselves forward to talk to us about their own experiences of depression? So David, if I could ask you that question first, please, and, and really welcome to this webinar, and thank you. Uh, thanks, Claire, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my, my name is David Bailey and I am I'm married and I have four kids and I've, I've been work, I've been with AWARE, a volunteer with AWARE for a while now. Um, the main reason that I volunteer with AWARE and, and more specifically why I wanted to take part in, in, um, in this event was my kids. Right, okay, I've got four children and all of them have had challenges, some, some more challenging than others, right, okay, and communication has not always been there. And I figured that if I'm going to get them to communicate about what they've been through, then I need to do it. And, and that's really why I'm taking part in this process. OK, great, David. I'll come back to you in a few moments. Thank you. So, Brianna, the same question to you, please. And Hi there. Uh, thank you. And you're very welcome as well. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you to all the folks that are aware because this is an incredible privilege. Um, so I am Brianna and I am not natively Irish. I'm in New York at the moment, but I live in Ireland in Dublin with my partner and our dog, Choo Choo. Uh, I guess the, the main motivation for me, I also volunteer like David for AWARE. Uh, I'm a life skills coach, so I volunteer for the life skills online program, but I've uh, struggled with depression and anxiety for much of my life. And I think um, continuing or starting a conversation is tremendously important around this issue. And I think, um, taking away the stigma by having a discussion and making it a normalized topic is crucial in order to continue a conversation. So that's why I'm here. And I just have to mention, because I'm not naturally a morning person, it's 7 a.m. in New York. <laughs> I don't know how long it took you to get up and get ready for this, but certainly you're up early. So really, thank you for that. So thank you. If, I, if I stay with you and then come back to David. So if you like to share whatever you want to share in terms of setting a context for your own journey through depression. And then I talk to David and then I come back to ask you about how you cope right now and how you manage these days. Um, I think I've had a lot of ups and downs um, throughout my life. Um, I first started recognizing signs of depression when I was very young, like in, in early childhood when I lost my father um, to an illness when I was quite, quite young, at nine years old. Um, and so I've been in treatment, in therapy throughout the course of my life. Um, I'm an only child as well, so I'm quite um, an introvert by nature um, and creative, and I was always kind of different. Um, and I think it was when I moved to Ireland, I started, it got a bit worse, I'd say. Can, can I alone. ask you just a little bit, because I can, I can hear people out there on the internet going, she just said the signs of depression, what does she mean? 
So when you said you noticed, what, what exactly did you notice, if that's okay to ask? Of course, um, I do think they're different for everyone. Uh, for me personally, it's a sense of, it depends on how, how bad I'm in the moment, but I think um, for me, it's a sense of feeling withdrawn and disconnecting from the people around me and the people I love best, um, not being fully engaged. Um, I've said it before, and I think this is, has been a resounding thing, but it's more than feeling sad. And that's kind of primarily the message that I want to communicate to others is that it could be many fold. It could be a lot of things, um, much more than feeling sad. And, and you mentioned you got therapy from, from age nine, but it was only when you came to Ireland as an adult that things began to click for you in terms of what it was. Is, is that right? Did I hear that correctly? Um, I was always aware that I had, um, difficulties with my mental health and I've been in treatment throughout my life here in the United States I've only been in Ireland for four years now um but it was when I kind of moved to Ireland that my perspective changed I would say on my mental health in the course of my treatment it's with the therapist that I have now that we're realizing that in order to better myself we kind of had the epiphany that um I don't need to be in therapy forever necessarily and that there are other resources available to me that I could avail of um in order to move forward in my life. But, you know, that makes so much sense. Brianna, <laughs> thank you. Um, David, if I can ask you, are you, can you relate to what Brianna has said or is your experience on your journey of experiencing depression, is that the same or different? It, I think it's different, right? Um, insofar as that I don't recall any episodes of depression um, as a child or even as a teenager or, or going up. I'm sure there were elements of, of, of sadness and challenge within a time frame but i don't recall it as being um, a depression my my um experience that really started when i was uh, working abroad uh, my whole career has been kind of up and up and up and up and and at a certain point in time that stopped happening right okay and i i, I was working for companies that really just didn't align with the way that i wanted to do things and and for the first time i started to experience failure right and, and, and that hit me really hard, right, where, where you know, in the, in the after a day at work, in the evenings, okay, the, 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 those inner thoughts just started to catastrophize, right, really, in terms of how I would reflect on where I am and how I would reflect on what I can do about it. I couldn't, I, I couldn't see through that haze. And I was, and, you know, uh, like I've said to you before, I, I really started to hide from that. And that was just another step on the on the on the on the road downwards i think into a, a period of depression that i found really difficult right um and the impact um the impact for me was just not being able to almost like not being able to do anything else right um it just got in the way of everything it was constantly um diverted if you like or, or constantly engaged in in inner thoughts right okay and, and negative self-talk that yeah just kept on bringing me down right and you know i stayed there for a period of time that was that was probably longer than it should have been um until i started to try and turn things around okay and um, i know one of the key questions we get in aware is from people who want to support someone who's experiencing what you've just said today and they would say what we what can we do how can we reach out so i'll ask you this question and then switch back to you brianna if that's okay so how what happened to make you able to start getting help or taking help was there a moment that you things changed or was it gradual or was it somebody else or? um yeah yeah no it, it, it i don't i don't know to be fair I, I i probably don't know what that was i know that that there were times when i would have would have had um um suicidal thoughts right okay and i think that they probably um, started it i mean everything was building and i think that was probably just a tipping point perhaps okay in terms of actually saying well you know what options do i have okay and, and uh, then just start the process of looking around okay well what what options do I have? What makes sense now, right? Um, and that prompted me to have a have a, a conversation, then, with, which started to to slowly turn things around. Okay, I, you know, I'm really glad you said that because I know that a lot of people get very frightened by thoughts that they prefer to be dead or they wish they were dead or they'd be better off, and and other people would be better off, and they call. 
them suicidal thoughts, as you've just said, but they can feel very, very frightened by those and they can think they're suicidal and there's a big difference. And just because anybody can have those thoughts, as you've said, does not mean that people have to harm themselves. It can actually be a great wake up call to realizing, you know what, I could get, I need, it'd be helpful for me to get help and take it. Um, Brianna, can I, can I bring you in please? Can you relate to what David is saying or was there a, a different tipping point for you to get help? Absolutely. Um, so much of what David just said resonated actually. It's interesting how two people could have differing experiences, but the emotional responses can resonate. Mm -hmm. um, I identify a lot with what David said about um, moving abroad. I think that experience for me when I moved from the United States to Ireland um, and kind of the same ex similar experiences of, um, for me, it was the isolation and the fear of failure. And I think experiences of kind of being the other in certain situations um, were quite triggering for me. Um, and unfortunately, um, I experienced for the second time in my life, serious thoughts of um, taking my own life, um, which I can thankfully say, I, I think identifying those thoughts and isolating them motivated me to get help and, and speaking about them, communicating them to others were actually quite effective um, in, in the course of my treatment. Um, for me, the, the pivotal moment was when I learned I had lost a friend to suicide. Um, and I learned from his mother that um, in, it's, it's an unfortunate story, but it's worth mentioning. He actually didn't want to take his own life and kind of in those crucial last moments, it was kind of a revelation he had that he didn't want to die and that desire to live was still there. Um, and for me, that was kind of the moment of, okay, um, it can always get better. And do I, it's, are things just so bad right now in this moment that I can't see past them? Or do I really want to die? I think that's a completely separate thing from wishing I could change my life. Um, and that's an important distinction to make no matter how bad the circumstances get, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm just thinking of a conference I went to years and years ago and the presenter talked about a man who had jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. And, yes. <coughs> excuse Perfect. me, and, and very few people survived, but he came back his learning from that was as he jumped, he realized he had a thought that everything in his life was fixable, except what he had just done. Yeah. And then he survived and he has spent, he's dedicated his life to helping people know that just as you said, there are always, always other options. Yeah. The thing that I kind of um, identify closely with in terms of what Brianna was saying was the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I mean, and, and I guess for me, I, I knew I had failed, right? Okay, now different reasons and, and different backstories all over the place, right? But I knew that I, and it was my inability to communicate it. It was the fact that I, I just wasn't willing to actually have any, I didn't want anyone to see me as a failure, right? Okay, mm -hmm. and it was so important to me, right? Okay, and, 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 and that just dragged it out. And, and it, still, it still plays a part, right? Okay, and, and probably until this process here, right that we're going through at the moment i never fully communicated the context to my kids never right okay and this occurred this would have been 10 12 years ago right mm -hmm. when it first occurred right okay and it still prevails today right because there's still many people in my circle that i haven't communicated that to right but obviously my, my, my own family obviously have, have the, that priority and because of their reluctance to talk up themselves in other challenges that they've had, right? That that's pushed me to kind of make that step. And and if if I could just finish with one one thing, because the difficult it was it was writing my story down. Okay, as part of some of the events that are taking place here, was not the difficult thing. The difficult thing was actually when I put it into an email to send to my kids was pressing the send button. That was so difficult, right? And and but once that was sent, I could changed everything, right? The impact that it had, okay, in terms of, of, of being able to communicate more openly was, was immediate, all right, okay. And, of course, it wasn't that my kids didn't know it, okay. I mean, they would have seen how I was reacting, okay, through that period of time, right, okay. So would have had a strong sense that, listen, yeah, things are not well, right. But it was only actually after communicating it myself to them that a significant change occurred. So in, in language that I use, you took your power back then, David. You were 
um, very much proactive in terms of letting your, your family know what's going on rather than withdrawing or hiding, um, which must have been really, as you described, really, really difficult. We've got some questions and um, one of them is related to can years of self-criticism and negative self-talk lead to depression? What would you both say about that? Brianna, would you, would you say yes or no to that? Absolutely. I think I can speak to this one personally, just because I am the queen of self-deprecating. Um, I, For me, the, the pattern of my depression is such that like, um, I, I don't know where it's derived from, but I have a terrible habit of, of self-criticism in every aspect of my life. In fact, when things are going well, I find, I, I said this once, I take a sledgehammer to all of the good things because I can't accept a pattern of good. It's, it's almost as if I'm averse to things going well in any way, shape or form. Um, and I'm, I'm immensely self-critical. Um, I think it's, it's a pattern of like, it's, 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 um, you're caught in a holding pattern, I think with, with depressive habits and, and that kind of that mode of thinking, right. Um, I'm not articulating it as well as I could, I think, but, um, I think a lot of folks who struggle with depression, it, it ha goes hand in hand with negative self-talk and negative thoughts about the self inevitably. Um, so I personally have experienced that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I was asked earlier today, how would I know or how would we know if someone is experiencing depression? And I was saying that it can be quite difficult and how we can know ourselves is we might feel a fraud ourselves. That we're putting on this appearance to the outside world, but we know deep down, actually, that's not who we are. And there can be a, a sense of wanting to withdraw so other people don't recognize that or spot, oh, we're not that person. So I'm looking at you, Brianna, and you have a beautiful smile and you look so relaxed and so content. Did other people pick up that you were experiencing the difficulties you were or did you hide it? Um, no, you know, it's funny. I think the people closest to me who have been with me throughout my life, like my mother or my, my partner, Dave, um, he's watching, I think they know because they live with me and they have intimate knowledge of what I go through. But most people like in the workplace, when they hear about this stuff, because I told them I was participating in the program, they had no idea. They'll say things like you're so buoyant and kind of how you how you present yourself outwardly doesn't match anything that you're saying. Um, but I think it speaks to this um, for me personally. I don't know if David can speak to this, but it's this want of wanting to, to be better for me. Um, it's the person I want to be is the way I present myself to the outside world. Yeah. Um, sorry, you, I hear my dog you, barking. You gave me a clue and there's a second clue. You've apologized for something that's not your fault. So that's always a, a little bit <laughs> for me. But the second thing is you put yourself down a few moments ago. You said, I don't think I'm, I'm getting this across the way I want to. So for yeah. me, there, there are clues that any of us might not actually be feeling the way that we're presenting, you know, because it's, it's Absolutely. an indication to our internal dialogue. And Dave, so thanks, Amelia. I'm constantly going from one to the other, but I want to get as much as we can okay. for your time. Um, David, there's, Brianna mentioned work there and her reaction from work. We have a question here. I felt a lot lately like I'm letting my team down and I'm struggling on work. How do you recommend approaching this with your boss? And do you re recommend taking sick days for mental health reasons? What, what's your response to that one? So it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the people I always felt I was laying down with my family, right, okay. And not being open about, not being open about it, it just, it just made it go on and on and on, right, okay. So, so unless we, take some step to dealing with it, nothing will change, right? Or is unlikely to change, right? The, I think that the, taking a, taking a mental health sick day or sick days, right? It can, can, be, can be helpful, right? Um, I think the, 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 the better step might be to open, have a, have a process through which, a, 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 let's say a conversation can be opened, right? Have an engagement through which people get to learn more about each other. Right, so that it becomes a two-way stream rather than a single way, rather than a single, a single opening of a conversation. Right, so having a conversation with, with, with your boss about trying to improve mental health within the workplace, right, um, can be a nice soft opener to getting into a deeper conversation about how you feel, right, and 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 it's that first step is the is the most difficult one. Right. Once that starts to once that that once you take that first step, the next one actually is a small bit easier and a small bit easier and a small bit easier. And the one thing that always 
stays with me, okay, when, when getting into conversations like that, is that you'd be amazed at how supportive everyone else is when you get into that conversation, right? People that, that previously you would have seen, you know, that, that person is doing a fantastic job. She'll have no fight, no time for me because I'm just not doing a good job, right? That person can immediately change into someone who wants to help you, okay, who wants to support you in, in terms of trying to do more within the job that you do, but also in terms of actually trying to put you in a better place outside of the workplace. So it's, it's those small steps, right, that, that really start to make that difference in terms of changing the context. And, you know, I really agree with you in terms of the mental health day, because sometimes it can be avoidance and it can be hard. We, we can take a day off to feel better. But then when we start thinking about going back to work, we might not feel better. And then then that becomes a, a, a difficult or more more of a problem. But Brianna, I know that um, you have the other side, which I also agree with in terms of taking the, the mental health day. Do you want to chip in there? Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with everything David is saying. I've experienced both types of workplaces where there is a conversation that's already happening, an inclusive workplace. However, I've also experienced workplaces where this isn't something that's um, the norm. Um, and I think on balance, if you are feeling like you need to take a day, accepting that it's okay to do so within the context of maybe just calling it a sick day, that it's okay to yourself to take a duvet day, it's fine giving yourself permission to do that. Um, and being kind to the self is okay. Um, sometimes you can't tell your employer, unfortunately, and that's where conversations like this are great because we're promoting having conversations about mental health um, and, and slowly but surely normalizing that. But if you can't have that conversation where I need to take a mental health day, taking just a plain old sick day for me has been okay, knowing that it's for me, if that makes sense. I absolutely. I'm really enjoying this conversation and bringing to life the conversation on Monday in terms of how can we recognize depression. The conversation with Dr. Keith Gaynor on Wednesday, how do we cope, which was really summed up in the words you've just said, kindness. So, David, if I can turn to you and ask, how do you what have you learned in your journey that really helps you with in be, I hate the word be well, because that implies that you're not well if you're experiencing difficulties, sure. but has helped you cope. I really like the word cope. Sure. Sure. There's been a few things. I've always been um, an avid reader and, and always looking to try and learn and to, to, to find out more about myself. Right. Um, one, one of the things I found is that the more I can understand myself, the better I can do something about myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, a number of books have really helped me in that regard. Right. Um, the Maureen Gaffney's book called Flourishing. All right. Um, was just it was I, I, it was highly impactful. Right. Okay. I, I don't want to call it transformational. Okay. But, but it felt that way. Right. Um, and the, the primary thing that I took from that was that, that Maureen spoke about the, the positive negative balance. All right. And she said, just trying to identify the positive negative things that you've got going on. She said that just to get by day to day, you need three positive things to one negative thing, such as the impact that negative things have on us from day to day to flourish. You have to have five positive for each negative right that sounds like a big task but 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 these are numbers and i like numbers okay and i like i like to be able to have my spreadsheet okay and be able to say well here's the three negatives here's the three positives and i started getting more involved in the positive things that i do so cycling was a big one um so i joined a cycling club right okay singing is a big one so i joined a choir right okay um you know Having a pet was one that we took, right? Okay, so as I showed you earlier, right? Okay, Ruby, Ruby came into the family, right? And um, so this was all part of just trying to build myself up, okay, in terms of having a positive outlook. And that made a big impact, right? So that's one of the things, very quickly, um, trying to understand more about inner consciousness, Michael Singer, absolutely fantastic. Um, the, mo the most, uh, the, the simpler of all of the books I've read about trying to get, trying to understand um, inner consciousness better, right? How to manage that, that, that inner talk, right? Okay, the, the, the negative inner feedback that you give yourself all the time. Simplest explanation of it. And finally, um, I have a morning routine, um, half an hour of exercise of stretching, meditation and breathing exercises. All right, okay, so I do those five, five mornings a week. So those, these are the things that I've, I've, I've tried to incorporate to my lifestyle. 
I, I'm looking at the questions. I was looking at them while I was listening to you, David, and you've answered some of them. There's a question about men, and there was also a question in terms of how do we how do we get men to reach out? Well, actually, if I can just ask you this one, then I'll, I'll move to you, Bri Brianna. I've supported men in my family who I know are depressed and need support. I've handed out numbers for them to contact supports, but they won't take the leap. What's yeah. your response to that, David, please? Oh, take the leap yourself. Lead by example. Right, okay. And, and that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why I said I, I wanted to take part here. Right, okay. And I think that, that family are the most immediate to anyone who is actually um, experiencing um, negative thoughts, depression, right? And actually just leading it. So actually going up and talking about some challenges that you're having yourself, right? And leading the conversation, being the example of what you want them to be, right? And that's what I want for my kids. Right, okay, and for my wife and for my own wider family. Right, okay, if they've got issues going on, well, I'd like them to come to me, but why would they if I'm not saying it to them? Yeah, that makes so much sense. And um, Brianna, the, the same question to you, but um, there's a, a person saying she has suffered from depression for much of her life, similar to Brianna. A few times has been in such a bad place that she's required time off and withdrawn from life completely. She's been doing reasonably well over the last year, despite the pandemic. And actually, this is something that I think you might relate to now that the restrictions are being lifted. It can be hard. So she lives in constant fear of the depression happening again. So is this something that either of you deal with or have any advice on? So, Brianna, I'm, I'm giving you that question, but also because we're, believe it or not, coming towards the, the, the time up, which is just incredible. But what you have found in your journey that really works for you? Um, for me, I think like right now, listening to David, I, I think I aspire to be where, where he is right. Like in my, I'm comparing myself to him already, but I'm thinking to myself, like, I want to be at that place in my recovery. Like to me, the idea of joining a choir is aspirational. I'm not there right now. I'm not at that stage quite yet. And so for me, I need to just pause and reflect and think, um, and reverting back to that message of being kind to oneself. I think the most crucial thing here is no matter where we are, and we have that fear of like, for me, backtracking for one second there's an ebb and flow to depression um what keeps me from being afraid of it coming back or having it breathe down my neck as such is this sense of um for me managing my emotions and my depression is knowing that um I'm going to be in control of who I am as a person um and kind of building towards a future that I may not be able to see in my darkest moments but I know it can be there so taking the smallest steps possible for me that might be might not be joining a choir just yet or joining the gym, but it could be getting out of bed or making the bed. Um, the, the small steps are always there. And so if we're afraid of it coming back, making one step towards combating it, if it's going for a walk, if for me, it might not be going to the gym, but it could be taking a walk around the block or walking through the park. The small steps towards progress are still steps. Um, so for me, it's incremental. I hope that resonates. I, well, it resonates with me listening to you, absolutely. And I think sometimes I know certainly I can feel overwhelmed by so many things to do. And if I break them down into small tasks yeah. and get something done, then that, that can be of help. We've got Quite loads, tough, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We've got loads and loads of questions and we're not going to get to all of them. Um, um, David, if I can go back to you. Um, yes, yeah, somebody's asked actually, what is the name of the book? And um, thank you, all. So that's really nice. Thank you. And somebody asking, when do you know to take a mental health day? Um, David, what is the name of the book? And then is there anything, is kind of your takeaway from this conversation? What would you really want to say and to be heard for people to know? Okay, so thanks, Claire. Uh, so it's uh, The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer, and it's uh, Flourishing by Maureen Gaffney, uh, the two books I was talking about. Um, yeah, for me, um, you know, if I could, if I could, communicate anything, right? Okay, it's the benefits that I have gained by just talking myself, right? Um, and that has already opened up many conversations between myself and my children, right? And my kids are, my kids are 19, 23, 25, and 31, right? Okay, so, so, so the, the, we can have mature conversations, right? Okay, and open conversations, right? Okay, that, that support them as much as they support me. Right. So if I would want anything to kind of come out of this and are, is that parents would open up those conversations as much as they can. All right. In the in the right context for whatever age their kids are. Right. Um, but just to start opening up. 
right? I think that 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 we 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 struggle. We, I think we know we struggle, right? Okay, in terms of opening conversations. But if parents can start, that they can support their own children in terms of having to deal with the challenges that they will come up against inevitably as they go through life. Yeah, that's 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 really unclear. And, and David, I'm going to actually add one other question in, and then I'll ask Brianna the two questions. I'm conscious that you both said that you very generously volunteer with AWARE. So you will be working to support people who at times might be experiencing difficulties that might tap into experiences that you had in your past. How do you manage to protect yourself so that you're a, in a position to be able to support them? Yeah, um, I, I go back to the, the Maureen Gaffney, the, the positive negative balance, right? And like my, I, I guess that's where I, I try to keep being kind to myself is, is identifying the things that I like to do and continuing to do those, right? And that, that helps me. And just the fact that I'm helping people, of course, is one of those positives, right? And it just adds to the list of positives that I work to. Wait, when I'm privileged to work with people, I suggest that they do plan and do one enjoyable thing, one pleasurable thing every day. And that can be really difficult to do. And I explain it's like pumping the village pump, that you pump and pump and pump before you get water. So you might not actually enjoy the pleasurable thing for quite a while, but keep doing mm -hmm. it. And Brianna, so the two questions for you, what you'd like as a takeaway from this, and then how you protect yourself when you're doing your work supporting other people who might be struggling and in this case is with AWARE and thank you both for doing that. Um, I think in terms of my volunteering efforts and engaging with um, the mental health community, I know I set limits and boundaries to what I do to protect myself. So um, I'm a life skills coach, as I mentioned, which is an online program for folks who are experiencing mild to moderate depression. Like for me, I think certain other ways of volunteering, such as the phone calls or the emails might be too much where I am right now but I know I want to be involved as much as I can in a capacity that I know I'm where I'm able for it. So I don't beat myself up for not being able to do emotionally to do the phone calls. Um, so that's one example. Um, I participate in suicide prevention walks where I'm involved with a community, a support network as such. Um, and these are ways of staying engaged and involved in the conversation but being able to kind of protect myself emotionally. And also knowing it's okay to be vulnerable if I'm vulnerable. I found myself choking up several times throughout this conversation and that's a productive thing, it's a good thing. Um, and then in regards to um, the first question, which is about what the takeaway is, um, I was looking at the, the questions and answers, the questions briefly, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, there are so many people here and whatever it is that brought them here, if it's their own experience of depression or wanting to learn more about it, um, my first thing would say be, it's not the be all end all for me, my depression, and that's one revelation that I've had. Um, I'm so much more than my depression, and that's a great thing. But also um, the biggest kind of, thing for me is that um, we're having a conversation and that's fantastic. No matter what has brought us here, we're all learning something today and that's phenomenal um, and it's worth celebrating. And I'm so glad that we're all here today, no matter what we got from it or gained from this, we all gained something and that's fantastic. Um, so yeah. I, I want to thank you both. I always ask people, you know, how do they find the conversation we've just had if, if I'm in a work situation and is there one thing that struck them as helpful? So I'm inviting people who are attending this webinar to ask themselves that question. How has it been? If they find that they're unsettled to maybe have a conversation with somebody they trust or to go to their GP because you've both been very open, very frank, and it could upset people in it. Not upset that you've done something wrong. I don't mean that and you know it, but it might bring something to the surface that's great that it's time to get that dealt with and sort it. And to be kind, that's a word that I just keep hearing. So AWARE has, uh, is for people who don't know it, is Ireland's national organization to support people with depression and bipolar disorder. They, this is the final part in our series for Mental Health Week. And we have had three really fabulous webinars I've been privileged to be part of. They're all recorded, so they're going to be there as a resource. Also AWARE has lots of other resources. Brianna, you mentioned the life skills. There are courses that are free to do based on cognitive behavioral therapy. There are support groups. There's the phone line, there's the email service, and there's a fantastic resource of lectures, webinars going back over a period, a period of years. And from 
this week was was different to celebrate mental health week to market but from next month we'll be going back to our monthly webinar webinar series and i can't remember what it is but we will be having a really interesting conversation next month and so i'd just like to finish with that unless david is there anything else you want to say before we go uh no just thanks for the opportunity right okay it's been a great um it's been a great week right um and it's it's allowed me to take a few more steps right along the way so thank mm -hmm. you very much oh you're so welcome and brianna is there anything you'd like to say i'm already thinking about all the things that we could i could have said um and so that the conversation doesn't end here so thank you everyone for coming it's been fantastic and this has been a great opportunity and the conversation doesn't end we can keep this going so thank you so much great you're so welcome and and if i may suggest something i know when i do things my mind tends to go i should have said this and why did i say that I wish I hadn't. so just you have said what you both said with absolute pure hearts and to just really trust that and let it go and moving on to the next one and that's sometimes harder to do I just really like to thank you both very, very much. And a bit of Irish all the way over to America, Gurmila Mahaga and Gurmila Mahaga David. Slongapol. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.